Ladies and gentlemen, I think we should continue with our session. I, if, I would like to invite everyone to join us again. And, uh, well, I think <coughs> after, after, <coughs> after, the discussion, after the discussion we have just uh, listened to by the ministers, I've put aside my introductory words and I would just refer basically to, uh, I think, to the discussion and parts of the statements uh, uh, by uh, the ministers in order to introduce the session Migration Crisis Management at the EU's External Borders, Geopolitics, Preparedness and Responses. Um, starting, I think, I noted down one statement by uh, the Greek minister, stronger border protection is one part of a wider strategy. One statement from the uh, uh, Minister of Hungary, we have to gain the ability back to be able to control our territory, who comes in. Um, and I had two notes for the Minister from Bosnia and Herzegovina, but I found the last, the very last one in the last round very interesting, actually, that any crisis brings to the fore uh, the advantages and disadvantages of a state system uh, to deal also with these, uh, with these crises. So, crisis management, external border, I think it was very clear that this is at the heart of the discussion um, um, in, uh, in Europe. Now, we will try to uh, continue, to, uh, continue to deal uh, with, these, uh, with these questions. Um, just uh, one procedural note, we, we have, of course, the possibility to have questions again at the very end from the audience, but also from the online audience throughout, uh, throughout the session. For the online audience, I would like to invite everybody not to wait too long, but to send in uh, uh, possible questions earlier. The earlier, the better. They can be taken into account uh, by the panelists when answering questions, also noting that our colleague from the European Commission will have to leave at 4.30 sharp. So if there are specific questions, we will get them on the screen uh, to benefit from uh, your presence. But I should first introduce my panelists. And it's a pleasure to have, well, almost as every year, uh, uh, Nina Gregory, the Executive Director um, from, what should I say? The European Asylum yes. Support Office, or Still. the agency, not yet the soon, agency, soon European, to be. Yes. soon to be the agency. So it's a pleasure to have you, uh, you. well, for me it's again, because we'll continue our conversation from last year. Uh, um, it's a pleasure having you. Um, we have two gentlemen with very interesting profiles, uh, uh, which I've had very curious for our session on crisis management and, and migration. Vladimir Shimonak, who is now a director for crisis management at the Slovak Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But interesting for us and the discussion on migration, Vladimir was for six years the head of the Justice and Home Affairs section at the permanent representation of, uh, uh, of Slovakia in Brussels. So you come with everything one has to know about uh, migration. Thanks very much for joining. And last but not least, a representative from the European Commission, Johannes Luchner. Uh, since more, a bit more than a year, I think now Deputy Director General of what we usually refer to DG Home, so it's DG Home Affairs and Migration, but interesting in terms of profile, you come with uh, long experience from uh, the uh, humanitarian aid side, emergency cooperation, so one moved from migration to Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the emergency, the other one moved actually from emergency <laughs> to the migration side, which is, which is interesting for our discussion. Um, with that, and to start with, I mean, we have a topic, uh, we have a topic, external border, crisis management, I mean, we, I think we have to be careful to stay focused, um, there's clearly an internal dimension, there's an external dimension to it, um, I mean, to start with, and I would like to start with uh, uh, Nina, I mean, we listened to our conversation at the Vienna Migration Conference last year, where you were hopeful right after the publication of the pact mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, things would advance in the right, in the right direction with regard, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the agency. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can say that uh, things have moved into the right direction. Obviously, I have but, a crystal ball, <laughs> no? <laughs> but, um, but in a sort of 
challenges, priorities. I mean, what does it change now mm -hmm. that we are in the situation for our topic, crisis management, external border? I mean, where does it help mm -hmm. that we now speak great at the EU? We have an, you know, we have an agency. We don't have any more uh, an asylum support office. Mm -hmm. Yes, let me first thank you and, of course, to Director General Spindelegger for this uh, kind invitation. Indeed, I'm quite a regular guest here at the, uh, the Migration Conference in Vienna, and, and, and I'm always delightful to, to come. And especially now, after the pandemics, it's so nice. It's nice that you were able to, of course, invite us here and that we see all our friends all around. So thank you very much for this, uh, for this uh, invitation. When we, talk, when we talk about the pact on migration and, and asylum, and we did talk about that indeed last year too, um, of course I can only say two very positive things came out of that already. I mean, definitely the, the first one was already echoed in some of the panels before. Uh, had, uh, definitely the political agreement between the, the member states and the European Parliament on the adoption of the new regulation to, for creation of the European Asylum Agency indeed has been reached in this June. And I think this was something that we all a bit forecasted and I'm really happy that this was established because it was difficult. It was difficult in the Council, it was also difficult, I would say, in the relationship with the, the two co-legislators, but we have it. So, I mean, it will, the regulation will enter into force and from the January 2022 on, we will have first and only European uh, Agency for Asylum. And I think it will change much, especially when we talk about the operations and when we talk about the asylum situation and handling and managing, I would say, uh, asylum inside of Europe. But it will also help with, um, let's say, operational co capacity building that as an agency we will be able to do and offer to our partners outside Europe. I would also mention, in connection with the PAC, two, let's say, points that I need to address. The first one is um, the discussion um, on the functionality of the system. Um, sometimes it looks like, and a bit, even if I turn back to the, to, the, to the discussion amongst the ministers, of course it's a political discussion, but sometimes we, we think that we don't have a functioning system in Europe, that Europe doesn't handle asylum, that we don't manage migration. I think this is not true at all. We have, I mean, every day, practically thousands of people, migrants coming to Europe, and of course member states, they do have functional asylum system, and Europe do, I mean, we do have a functional multinational asylum system. And in this respect, absolutely, we have some failures in the system, and the system doesn't function well, and we need to repair those failures. But I think it's important for our side, side to admit that, that this can be done. And I will tell you one very concrete example. Minister Mitaraki mentioned that we had, um, last week, a 10-year anniversary of our agency, right? So the Asylum Support Office, we celebrated that with friends in Malta, and 10 years, I mean, so in the past, there was only a handful of people working in the agency. We only had 8 million euros of, uh, of budget. Today, we have 500 people working in the headquarters, thousands more working in seven member states where we operate, and three uh, uh, cooperating, I mean, cooperating also in, in the countries uh, in external dimension. And of course, we have a huge potential. So it's not true that Europe is, is, is not so working well when it comes to migration and asylum, but there are many things that need to be repaired. And I do think that with the new dynamics that we are facing now in Europe, that this is going to still, let's say, be a good reason why we should continue with the negotiations on the pact and why this pact needs to be adopted at the end of the day. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Nida. Very clear. Um, I'm just looking at my, uh, at the time, <laughs> oh, no. but uh, Vladimir, still, I wanted to uh, first to have you come in, probably very shortly, and then we'll uh, give the floor to, uh, to you, Johannes, also to, to combine a little bit the different uh, questions uh, before, you have, uh, be have, uh, before you have to leave. Uh, I mean, Vladimir, you have been a you know, long-term observer uh, to the situation. Uh, we heard also the ministers refer to sort of a recent letter by a number of member states where it explicitly mentioned sort of we are crisis situation. We have looked uh, also today, I mean, from, you know, around the borders, uh, and it was rightly mentioned that also now what we have at the eastern borders, it's unprecedented. Uh, we haven't seen that. So we have situations where we have crisis situations. We speak about threats. The letter speaks about hybrid threats. Uh, um, 
also also to you sort of uh, to get going in the in the in the discussion how do you how do you look at that what do you make out of that uh, um, in terms of challenges priorities uh, yeah in a, in a in a nutshell thank you and first of all thank you for the invitation it's a true privilege to be here in this distinguished panel but also to see plenty of the friends and colleagues uh, not as pictures on the screen but actually you know live something i uh, lost the habit of of experiencing so it's uh, uh, it's, it's excellent to, to have once more. I'd like to honestly avoid the whole theology about what a crisis is and where it begins and where it ends and how it develops and everything, but indeed there's plenty of situations that um, exhibit a very much, a very stark difference between expectations and outcomes and existing institutions and legislation do not seem to be capable of really making a substantial difference. And in migration, I think also the pact works, um, I mean, designates as a crisis the situation of mass inflow of migrants. So I think we could adopt this as the sort of, um, you know, tentative uh, definition of what a crisis would be. And obviously, uh, also locally, uh, the arrival of, the irregular arrival of a few thousand people to Cyprus is a high impact event because it's a small country, which has been under tremendous pressure for years now, might not necessarily be perceived as a crisis outside of Cyprus, but it's, it's still a member state. It's something that concerns all of us. So when it comes to the, uh, to the situation, uh, to, to your question, um, I think indeed the situation at the borders with Belarus is a bit exceptional. Uh, the easy way out of the question would be to start mentioning Afghanistan, Central Mediterranean, and Africa. You know, uh, previous speakers uh, today have made those points much uh, better than I possibly could. But when it comes to Belarus, I think we are um, uniquely badly equipped to deal with, this, uh, with that situation. Because the uh, subtitle of this conference is Migration Partnerships, where we lack a partner, we even lack a counterpart, to be honest. We are dealing with an actor who is actively hostile, and uh, day by day, we are leaving the realm of diplomacy, even in the most rudimentary uh, sense. I think yesterday, or the day before yesterday, uh, the French ambassador to, to Minsk was uh, invited to leave the country. And, you know, besides uh, France being France, uh, there is also uh, France as the upcoming council presidency. So where does this leave us? in terms of the most rudimentary possibilities of, of uh, um, it's even ridiculous to, to think about partnerships or partnership, but even the most rudimentary communication. So this leaves us in a realm that is outside of uh, migration management, and it's almost purely becoming a realm of public order and internal security, which is a, a situation that we honestly, as the European Union, are not used to dealing with. So looking at the whole horizon of potential existing emerging crises, I think this is something that might not be as stark in extent, but certainly has disquieting elements that make me point out this particular situation. Thank you. We'll come back. Uh, we'll come back. Uh, we'll come back to that. But we'll want to uh, benefit from uh, from your presence for the uh, yeah for the ten minutes uh, we'll have. And I can only invite you to be a little bit longer and combine external dimension and internal dimension and uh, other messages or also what you might want to react to what you heard before from the ministerial discussion. Uh, but it's clear that everybody looks at the European Commission. It's about a year ago that the Commission came with a proposal of the pact, where we have and that also for ICMPD we noted that very much. I mean you have all sorts of measures, proposals for legislative measures, and then you have practical, actually, uh, uh, or operational measures which are, which are proposed, also as lessons learned from 2015, uh, um, to be better, uh, you know, to be better equipped to, to deal with crises, whatever, we are not going to discuss, you know, what is a, I mean, now, you know, what is a crisis, was it a crisis, was it not a crisis, but yeah, so I would uh, like to yeah, hear from you, but, and as I said, feel free to Thank you very external, much. Internal I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, maybe to start with that the pact on migration, and it was implicit also in the ministerial discussion today, is closely linked with Schengen. 
so we're not talking about a pact with 350 pages legal proposals. We're probably talking about thousands of pages. And therefore also the notion that somehow everybody can choose within Schengen is true, but you automatically always choose for the others because it's a space for free movement uh, of people. And that leads me to the first point. The pact is about creating trust among member states and finding a system in which uh, they can trust each other. The discussion about quotas we don't have inside the Commission uh, anymore, but it is, of course, a, a discussion about trust. Then second, on the notion of crisis, we don't define it. And I would like to point out that the pact is a proposal and nobody in the Commission, and certainly not Commissioner Johansson, has ever said, this is it. What we have said is, this is the best we can come up with, listening to the discussion in particular since 2015. And now it is up to the Member States and the European Parliament uh, to find solutions. We're very flexible if anybody has better proposals uh, that could get majorities. We didn't define crisis because from experience we know that member states don't want us to define crisis. Where I came from, the world of natural catastrophes, which are easier to deal with, like earthquakes and things, crisis means that your capacities are overwhelmed by the event. And therefore, I would fully agree what is a crisis in Lithuania for other countries like Italy, Spain, Greece is day-to-day -day management. Uh, there, wouldn't be, there wouldn't be a crisis. One comment on the, on the notion that because somebody is building a border fence, uh, we are creating fortress Europe. I think that's very effective rhetorically, and I think it is a very superficial description. Fortress Europe would mean to keep people out for reasons other than they don't have the international status of protection to stay inside uh, the European Union, or to keep people out as a matter of principle. We live on a continent with a net immigration of one and a half to two million people per year. So I don't see Fortress Europe. Third point, Belarus, we weren't prepared for that. Absolutely true, we weren't prepared for that because it's unique. Uh, and I would not compare it to any other situation we've lived through before. Uh, quite simply because this isn't a migration question, it is an instrumentalization of migrants as a foreign policy tool. And quite honestly, if somebody has a better alternative uh, for the Baltic states and for Poland, than to say we need to do something about that, because otherwise we will be totally overwhelmed and in crisis. Uh, I'm happy to, to hear those ideas. Uh, but the fact that we defend ourselves against the tax of a neighboring country to me doesn't seem to be uh, particularly exceptional or, or worthy of a long discussion. Of course we need to do that. What we must not forget that it's done on the back of migrants and we do have a lot of fundamental rights discussions constantly in DG Home, and my question is, uh, you know, who is violating whose rights where, bringing people into a swamp area uh, where some of them will die and some of them have died, forcing them to stay there at gunpoint, uh, that to me is an abuse of fundamental rights. Very briefly on the external dimension, it's a mirror of the internal dimension, and in a way, it's a bit easier to say, let's do something on the external dimension. Let's make plans. Let's talk to third country governments. And I think it's worthwhile thinking about other political entities who have managed to deal with problems that we can't deal with. Let's take the United States. I know we're not in the United States of Europe. But imagine a migrant from Central America whose application for protection was rejected in Mexico. Imagine that migrant then goes to Arkansas and says, I want to apply again, and he can. And then they reject it again, and then he goes to New York City and he says, I want to do it again. That's what's happening in Europe. It is a relatively irrational system just from a management point of view. I'm not talking about the moral point of view, just from a management point of view. When we talk about returns, 
and I think they are important. We see that now in, in uh, Lithuania, for instance. Um, why are we not able to reach, to reach agreements? Why are we not able to have partnerships that include in practice this mutual recognition of the obligation to take your own people back? Um, and again, if I look at bigger countries, and it's not only the United States, it's very clear because we don't speak with one voice. Uh, in the extreme case, we speak with 28, and then maybe national parliaments, and then maybe the European Parliament, and so on. So I think there again, uh, we quite simply need, we need uh, more coherence uh, and a, a clearer language. And I would add another thing. You know, we need to go away from the lip service of partnership into partnership. And for returns, it means to give people an opportunity to have a perspective in their home countries. Otherwise, they will come seven times and more. So we need to accompany that with a real partnership, also helping host countries or countries of origin with very weak administrative capacities very often to actually uh, give those migrants uh, the perspective they try to, to find in the European Union. I stop there for a moment. Well, there are only a few minutes left. Many thanks. I wanted to, we have some questions already from our online audience. And there's one, and it would have been actually my, for you two, it will be my final question to you. But, uh, <laughs> Johannes, you'll get the final question already now. It's the third one. Do you have recommendations regarding new tools that can be used to respond to migration crisis? If we reformulate it a little bit, it's, you know, after what we've seen, after discussions, after one year of the pact, is there already something uh, uh, where, also referring to the title of our conference, you know, you want to reimagine something, uh, uh, or which has proven not, I th not useful, or is it too early? No, I, I think the tools, no, the tools are in the pact. And as the Greek minister just mentioned, and I had the same thought when you see what's happening now, um, one, member's one member state's responsibility today might become that member state's solidarity tomorrow because migration paths change. Who would have thought a year ago that we're going to start to talk about the Baltics and, and Poland? So I think the proposals and the key tools are in the pact. And I think we very often talk about crises quite simply because we don't have the tools uh, that we do have in the pact because the tools are there to manage even situations of a crisis in a reasonable manner. And I would want to underline, in particular, also in a non-bureaucratic manner that will, will uh, make life easier for member states. If you allow me, you didn't ask me, just on the first question, no, not primarily. We should not. The question is, if I can, just because Sorry. the audience doesn't see it. So, should we should we be viewing different aspects of migration and migration management primarily through a security lens? No, I would say no, because the problem with our discussion is always that uh, when we talk migration, we talk irregular migration, which is only a very small part. When we talk irregular migration, of course, we uh, talk about crisis, we talk about terrorist attacks, which again are only a small part. We need to concentrate on the part in the middle. There is a clear security link uh, and an aspect that needs to be taken care of uh, in migration, but we shouldn't primarily look at that uh, through, through that lens. Definitely not, because it's, again, it's an outlier and we need to deal with the main problem first. Thank you. Last question, I'm still interested. With the pact, there are provisions, as we said, sort of on more cooperation. I think there's sort of a network to be established. Now, in the case of Afghanistan, uh, was that applied? have, uh, have uh, as a response the EU institutions plus I think the agencies participate, member states, uh, um, crisis appears and there is a response, someone, I don't know, uh, pushes yeah. the button and uh, ev we, everybody is informed, uh, um, yes, information we, is circulating and we, so on? We, we have uh, an information network which for reasons unbeknownst to me is called the Blueprint Network. I think we need to find another name that is more <laughs> comprehensible. Uh, but yes, the information is flowing and I think the, the approach, but also the financing, and now we're talking of course about uh, humanitarian evacuations, about resettlement, admission, uh, all of that I think is much better coordinated than it was in the past, not least also thanks to uh, the agencies that have grown tremendously, both Frontex and the ASO, uh, over the last years. 
Uh, maybe if I could make one last point on Belarus, because the impression is sometimes created that this external dimension doesn't exist. We find it very easy right now, with most countries of origin of these flights, to stop them. Because we're absolutely united, there isn't a single member state who finds this desirable and who wouldn't pass the message to the countries, this is of strategic interest. If I'm not mistaken, we are at 15 to 20 countries where we have made demarches, sometimes alone, sometimes with member states. We're following the routes very closely. We're doing that. And as I said, in 90% of the cases, it works relatively immediately because people see this is the entire European Union, not just one member state or the commission and the few. It is all of them and it is a strategic interest. So it does work. Many thanks. Thank you and my apologies. Many thanks for joining and uh, yeah, have a good trip back. We'll still continue. Uh, before we open for more questions, I'd also invite you. Still, I want to come back uh, um, to what we call the, uh, the internal dimension or really the, the external border. Uh, um, and probably two same questions also for, I mean, to, to both of you, concerns both of you. An external border normally, we, you know, there's something very technical to it, and that's the large scale IT systems, which are you know, put forward, they will be there soon, 2023, uh, for implementation. I mean, some argue this will really sort of, it will be a paradigm shift, uh, and much more information you can, you, you know, at your disposal to inform actually uh, policy making and, uh, uh, and, uh, and so on. That's one question I would like to, would be interested to hear, uh, to hear you on that, what you expect from that, mm -hmm. that part. Uh, um, and the other part is also um, when we say crisis management, it's, and we don't have it in the title, we have response, but I would also add actually we have to anticipate. Are you, in this, uh, you know, for also from the agency then, uh, do you think that you're able to anticipate or is it more reactive uh, what, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, what, uh, what you will be doing? Yeah. But let's start first with the, I would, yes. the uh, large scale IT systems. I know that you have uh, also followed large scale IT systems, so I would, I would be interested to hear you on that. Um, is it a game changer? Uh, when it comes to the functioning of the EU asylum system, that what then, what is not in Eurodac simply does not exist. And how things are being registered in Eurodac is the shape of reality that we work on. So it is definitely a game changer. And uh, the large scale IT systems also, you know, now not, not focusing uh, exclusively on Eurodac, you know, when they come online, I'm I suspect we are going to see things that uh, we perhaps do not even imagine. And we're going to see patterns that right now we are trying in a kind of astrological process uh, to, to, to derive from the available data. I honestly have very uh, high expectations for the uh, IT systems. I'm not going to bore the audience with uh, the details of those expectations, but I'm very much looking forward to the day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't Nina, on both questions. Yes, um, I would. I would take. I would just follow what Vladimir has just said. I mean, indeed, it's it's really interesting from the perspective, from the internal perspective, and this is also, let's say, perspective of the use of tools that we have internally in European Union. Um, it, well, the interoperability be, be, be amongst our big IT system. This this does not exist. We didn't have the basically legal uh, framework for that. We have huge, large IT systems, but interoperability be between them, it's, it's not there. And with that, I just to give you one sentence, in Europe still, we count files of asylum seekers, not asylum seekers themselves. So we don't count the people, and we don't really know how many asylum seekers do we have now in Europe. So I think that this is really just an echo from my end. What kind of tools do we have and how do we use them? Um, when I go a step further, when we discuss about the tools internally, of course, and this reflects then our, I would say, image also externally, the use of tools, our agency for sure, it's a tool. We don't perceive ourselves, and we're not definitely a political body. We are the executive agency, so the executive arm um, that support and help our member states internally. But with that, of course, we just need additional, let's say, technical tools, and I will not also bother our public with that, 
but which are essential when it comes to the asylum um, system and the functionality and good and uh, effective asylum procedures. And this is what, uh, let's say, the Minister of Greeks um, mentioned, so Minister uh, Mitaraki mentioned that in the, in this, in this, the, the, so the political panel, is that indeed, if you have fast and efficient asylum procedures, and really, we really did that um, very effectively in the last two years uh, together with our Greek partners. We really cleaned the full backlog of the asylum applications in Greece. Um, with that, of course, then you just need to have additional part of the system working too, and that's of course also return. With that, then you need to have very good and cooperation, I mean cooperation, very good cooperation with our partners, but this cooperation, does, it's not an, a European needs-based cooperation. It needs to be a partnership, and I think this is what your conference is all about. So this partnership, the, the return part is only one small dot or one small part in the cooperation with partners, which of course from European side, it's easy to sell politically, but then how do we manage that if we don't, of course, take a look at the whole spectrum of tools for cooperation that of course we can use and we have in Europe and we are developing that. Also what, of course, uh, Mr. Lochner has said, we, from the other perspective, from humanitarian aid for the development aid, so this needs to be incorporated in, in the toolbox as such, uh, for sure. When it comes to the, to the, to the, to the management of the, uh, let's say, external borders, yes, I think that it was rightly said from the Minister of uh, Hungary that five years ago, politically, that was the only possible agreement in Europe. Just protects the internal border. As it is now the only possible political agreement, let's do the work outside. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think that we also need to clean the house inside of Europe, and I think we, with PACT, we can address some of those issues. Mm -hmm. And I do hope that still the negotiations will, will be, I mean, let's say, positively developed, and that we will, at the end of the day, we'll have tools inside of Europe which, with which we can address the questions that we have inside. Okay. That's a, yeah, more positive messages we have on the certain things which are uh, functioning. But still on the question on to anticipate, because that, I mean, often, you know, crisis is reactive. Also, the, with its name of the blueprint network, information is flowing. Mm -hmm. Vladimir, I mean, you're also now, I mean, you know, director for crisis yeah. management in the MFA. I guess you want to anticipate uh, uh, things. Um, do you see that happening? Yes, particularly if I compare it with uh, you know my early experience uh, with what I saw in Brussels in 2015. Okay, mm. I mean the the kind of uh, data availability that we have now, the kind of analysis that is being undertaken on a routine basis. I mean. Mr. Lochner also uh, is wondering, perhaps as I am, why the whole framework is called the Blueprint Network. But regardless of the name, it is uh, something that uh, I think would have spared us many controversial debates back in 2015 if it had been in place. It is just uh, something that we were missing. The IPCR came online yes. and made a lot of the debates that also the ministers, even leaders, have been having uh, it made most, uh, a lot of those debates much more constructive, much more focused on the actual situation on the ground and not on, let's say, mutual um, suspicions uh, between the participants. So, right now, if we are looking at, um, if we are looking at uh, the data, we can see also what is coming our way. There are analytical tools available that uh, sort of give us an insight what is likely uh, to appear in, in, in a few months, uh, maybe, maybe uh, a bit, bit longer. But this is something that was sorely missing back then. So uh, being in the capacity that I am right now, I am actually rather confident that I do have all the data available, all the analytical products I need in order to approach my superiors and point out, sir, madam, there seems to be something brewing. Maybe you could, you know, find it in your schedule to um, to consider this or that, mm -hmm. which is something that makes me sleep much better at night, honestly. Yeah. Maybe to, yeah, just to add to this. No, I, I totally agree with uh, Vladimir. Also in EASO, we have a really big analytical. Um, department which deals, of course, with forecasting, and we do have information available. Yeah. I mean, this uh, awareness raising of what might come and what is already there, definitely this we have in Europe, yeah. and we should just, in a way, use it. So it's, it's a part of the tools that probably are not so many, I mean, also popular, because sometimes some decisions 
especially political decisions, need to be, let's say, put in place in advance, or they will need to <laughs> let's say, decide on the strategy a bit in advance, and sometimes this is difficult to, of course, achieve in, 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 in a political world. Maybe just one sentence on the digitalization, because it's really a very important topic, and I thought uh, it goes back to the toolbox. We've tried on the ground with our partners in member states during COVID now, the remote procedures when it comes to asylum. So we tried in practice remote, um, remote uh, registration of asylum seekers. We tried in practice remote interviewing. We tried in practice the use of remote interpretation in asylum procedure, and this works. It works, and it, it's a huge opener for the future of asylum. Um, but also for, uh, let's say, the, uh, working hand in hand with our partners countries. Because of course, with that, we can enhance resettlement, we can enhance humanitarian pathways to be opened, because why would you need big delegation coming back and forth if you can assure also with all the uh, respect of the data protection and the, of course, you know, human, human I would say, uh, in respectful way, asylum procedures that can be taken, let's say, from the couch. We can do that, and I think that this is a huge potential for our future uh, collaboration also. Thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting for sharing. It's still on digital IT. There's one, one question which came in from the online audience. For, for Vladimir, I would like to ask you, when we have the entry-exit system in place, will the crisis shift from irregular arrivals to overstayers? Because that is, I think, is another reality we do have in the European Union. Uh, the issue of overstayers. Uh, this is again something that uh, relates very closely to the uh, political interpretation, ultimately a political interpretation of what the crisis is. Because uh, regardless of how many irregular arrivals we have in the EU, they are still dwarfed by the number of people who arrived legally, uh, arrived legally, then maybe overstay many of them. So. To, to, um, to attach the label of crisis to any sort of number of overstayers, I'm not sure that really reflects the reality we've been experiencing. Because in the end, truly, the, the, uh, the dividing line between what is a crisis and what isn't, in practical terms, is uh, the political interpretation of that. And then, entry-exit certainly is going to provide this is, again, something that I have to emphasize, I'm very much looking forward to experiencing, is a new quality on data on, on actually how many overstayers, what are the patterns of those overstayers, uh, of those overstays. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, a blank spot that should have been removed uh, years ago. Uh, we are heading to, towards that, and it's going to provide us with a lot of food for thought, I would say. Can I just add Always. a sentence? Yes. yes. No, because it's um, it's really good. It's really good point and really good question. And just a, a step forward um, to see this also through statistics. Uh, before COVID, in Europe, we had per year 120,000 irregular arrivals per year, but we had per year 600,000 asylum seekers or the applications. So, how do you then? balance this equation, exactly what it, it was said, we don't know. So are all those, more than 120,000, are all those overstayers? Or are those repeated applications of the asylum seekers? Or are those the ones that do secondary movements, but we don't, we don't comprehend them in the Eurodex system? This is what interoperability will bring, and then we will be able to really discuss migration management in Europe, I think. Thank you. Very clear. Let us uh, now get, go a little bit more to the uh, what we call the external dimension before then opening up also here for the uh, uh, for the audience. Now I'm actually uh, I'm personally I'm a little bit puzzled uh, or I'm wondering whether whether we have the right title of our conference about migration partnerships when uh, having listened to what we said about Belarus. Um, when we heard the minister speaking about the Western Balkans, where we have, uh, uh, you know, some other big powers uh, trying to get influence and so on. And speaking about migration partnerships, let me put it that way, sounds always very, sort of very innocent. Uh, uh, but in the end, and we put it here in the title, it's about geopolitics. It's actually, don't we have to speak much more about, I mean, you know, foreign policy, where migration is a part of um, the external dimension, again, 
can sound as a very technical, technical uh, issue, but looking especially at the situation, you know, what has been described uh, also by Mr. Luchner uh, in, in Belarus, and then the answer which you need where you mobilize, let's say, the world of foreign policy to find answers and to talk to, uh, uh, talk to countries in order to explain that it's not a good idea you know, to have the flights uh, to, to, uh, to Belarus. So I, I personally, I, I have the impression there is something to, to, well, to further discuss about the, you know, the quality of what we call the external dimension uh, um, yeah, for, the, for the years to come, because we see that there are so many dimensions. But then also when we say foreign policies, we have the different actors. Vladimir, you are now representing the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, um, there are many colleagues here in the audience from Ministry of Foreign Affairs to, uh, uh, to have a, their role uh, to play. I don't know. Am I totally off track with my, <laughs> with my analysis? Or, or um, we had a bit of an exchange on that with geopolitics. You said in your introductory statement uh, as well. Um, Vladimir, your point of view. The interaction between, uh, let's look at it institutionally, the foreign ministries and other in authorities involved. Um, I think that, you know, however you would approach um, migration partnerships, there are two characteristics. First, it is not a one-off thing. There needs to be a sustainability over long term. And it is structurally a, a process of give and take. There needs to be involvement from both sides. And, you know, creating and sustaining such processes, I think uh, foreign ministries are much better equipped, culturally maybe, you know, uh, are much better equipped uh, for engaging in that kind of uh, long-term process. It is more typical for a foreign ministry than an interior ministry, I've been working for the Ministry of Interior for 13 years, uh, to, to be interested in sustaining a dialogue even if it is not immediately delivering and to, to realizing that sometimes there need, just needs to be some time in order to, uh, to, to have any sort of delivery from the dialogue. So I think this is one crucial responsibility of uh, the whole foreign policy community <clears throat> within uh, the member states, uh, but also within the EU. We have had repeatedly uh, intentions approved from very senior levels. There was this partnership framework approved by the European Council in June 2016, uh, which even back then was not quite innovative. It was, um, you know, let's say, um, a bit of reinterpretation of things that had been approved before. Um, I'm not sure whether that really, you know, uh, fulfilled the promises that have been uh, that have been put into it. So I think there needs to be a bit more seriousness attached to this responsibility, also from the uh, foreign affairs community. And secondly, more on the substance, um, if the authorities entrusted with migration management, typically ministries of interior approach their partners abroad, uh, they typically do not have that much in their hands to offer. So there is also the responsibility of coordinating, you know, things that could be offered from other policy areas, be it trade, uh, you know, some others, to make the partnership, to make the counterparts uh, more interested in the partnerships. And this is a very unpopular role, I understand that, but again, this is something which uh, is either going to be taken seriously by uh, those who should uh, take it more seriously or is going to simply handicap the whole ambition of sustaining migration partnerships. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know if you want to come, not on this one. <laughs> um, because then I'm, I'm, yeah, time is flying. I would like to open up uh, um, to see if there are Questions here in the or in the audience. Uh, both we have spoken a lot this uh, today and right now as well on the external dimension, but otherwise also more targeted question on the external do external border. There are some colleagues in the audience who we know we had a we had a good panel last year. They can also come in. Come in. Um, uh, I see the State Secretary from Tunisia. Oh, no, the uh, Please. Je vais intervenir en français. 
Voilà, je suis Hamid Arès, je suis directrice générale de coopération en matière de migration. Donc, je représente le ministère des Affaires sociales euh, en Tunisie. Euh, je tiens à remercier tous les intervenants. Et ma question s'adresse à, à madame la représentante de l'Agence euh, européenne pour euh, l'asile. Ma question, c'est est-ce euh, qu'il euh, y a une sorte de chevauchement entre euh, vos attributions et le champ d'intervention de l'UNHCR et le lien existant entre le pacte donc, européen de migration et asile et euh, le pacte mondial pour euh, les réfugiés. Merci. Thank you. The direct, the, if I may quickly to repeat in English, was the Director General from the Ministry of Social Affairs of uh, Tunisia. And the question for uh, Nina Yu, um, with regard to your responsibilities, with regard to UNHCR, if there are sort of duplication or how that uh, is articulated. And also, well, that's a broader question. Uh, um, we were, uh, um, would have needed our colleague from the European Commission, whether with regard to what is called the Pact on uh, Migration and Asylum and the, uh, the Global uh, Compact, how this relates to each other. I'll see if someone wants to comment on that. Uh, um, yeah, otherwise we might not be able to fully address that question. But the first question on the um, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question and indeed uh, relevant one. What I'm very, I would say, happy, honored that, uh, honor that of course we do have a working arrangement with UNHCR, which is functioning. Well, we're very, um, I mean, I would say that UNHCR has always been since the beginning, since we started as an agency, a uh, very relevant stakeholder, stakeholder of, the, of EASO, of the agency, and also we have a, let's say, institutionalized uh, relationship with them because indeed they are also sitting in our management board. Uh, so the agency has, of course, the management boards where UNHCR is, is definitely a member of that with no voting rights, but we uh, basically we do um, cooperate there on the governmental level and then operationally, of course, we are always partners. Whenever, wherever we are and we work, UNHCR is there and we are partnering. We just, we don't want to Applications, of course, in our work, our mandates are different. Uh, we are a European agency, meaning that, of course, we do respect the Geneva Convention and the framework out there, the protocol of New York. But then, of course, we have different mandates when it comes to the cooperation uh, in external dimension, but also in, when it comes um, to the support of our member states so internally. Uh, when it comes to the, the pact and, and uh, the global... Uh, so, the, so the pact on migration, asylum um, and UN, in fact, abs absolutely there is correlation for sure. And of course, also through the, uh, I would say, the elements, not only of the pact, but also uh, the elements of the uh, development cooperation, um, the European Commission under the chapeau of that, so for sure, um, the implementation of the global compact, compact when it comes to the relationship of the pact on migration, it's, it's relevant and it does exist. And it's definitely um, imp will be implemented through when this is going to be negotiated, at, I think, till the final stage. Thank you. Any more questions? Please, over here. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Raul Brecken, uh, Director of Home Affairs in the Council of the European Union. Um, Nina and Vladimir, one question. Um, crisis management is also about preparedness, so uh, being ready for the moment. So do you think that uh, our EU agencies, uh, EASO, Frontex, Europol, um, are ready to deploy as quick as they can? Uh, do you do contingency planning? Is there an area you think we need to invest more in? Give one example. Everybody you know, has in the back of their mind, there might be a flow from Afghanistan. You know, have you got pools of uh, interpreters in those languages that might be needed, ready to be deployed, etc., etc.? Is is that something that is uh, sort of uh, going to be more in in the in the heart of of your future work? Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Very very hands on, and also, I mean, you know, so far one could have uh, one could have been surprised that we so far we had a discussion without mentioning Frontex when we mm -hmm. speak about the external border, uh, uh, which is of course. Uh, well, 
it's not deliberate, but uh, there are so many things to, to focus on. But on this one, very hands-on question, practical yes. preparation. Yes, this uh, is one, one of my favorite questions, and thank you, Ruhl, for asking me <laughs> you that. Set that up. <laughs> because, no, it's not a setup. No, I swear to God, no, Ruhl is my different, but really, it was not scenario. So. <laughs> no, I think that, I mean, it's, it's my pleasure to reply to that because I did not have the chance to mention that, but of course with the new regulation and the establishment of the asylum agency, we will going to be equipped with certain tools that we are lacking now. When we talk about operational um, help and support, um, when, uh, let's say, a crisis situation, whatever you call it, uh, um, uh, emerges, for we will have um, now the possibility to deploy um, from the so-called reserved pool, um, so 500 experts on asylum and, uh, and reception from the member states. The reserve pool is going to be there at our disposal and we will be able to, in a crisis moment, situation, to deploy them immediately. So this was something that, of course, we were missing as EASA, but this is going to be a very big step forward for us. Mm -hmm. Then, as an agency, we also have the possibility to have experts on our own contracts. Of course, that will mean that we will have the possibility to create a roster system and we will be able to escalate our support um, flexibly, I mean, with a flexible way, up and down. This was also impossible for now. We would need for that more resources, but that's another debate. So then the third point, which is very relevant, is that we will be able to deploy um, so-called so lesion officers in the member states, but also outside, so in the third countries. We'll be able to have cooperational uh, working arrangement with partner countries. So there will be many things that will come now on our table and it is going to be at our disposal. So I think that this, the new functionalities of the agency are going to immensely increase our operational role. And my vision is that we don't only deal as the European Asylum Agency with the crisis situation. I think that um, to address um, targetedly the issues that all member states have in Europe when it comes to asylum, I think that we will be able to do that in, in the future. So I, we, I mean, are now present in seven member states, and I only can say that the last two operation, operating plan with Lithuania and Latvia have been put together in the three weeks time. Mm -hmm. I don't think that ever in history of Europe, um, any, and I'm, I have all respect to, to my colleagues in, in Europe and in Frontex, but I don't think that this deployment of, of support on the ground was ever so fast. So I, with that, I'm proud, but I'm also thankful to our partners, to Lithuania and Latvia, because of course, they, we did together the needs assessment and it was done really in a brief, brief uh, period of time with, of course, the contingency in the system and the preparedness that, that we, we've discussed um, on, on, on the previous okay. question. Thank you. Um, any more questions from the audience? Otherwise, there's one from I w would like to take from the online audience. Um, there's an, uh, a question which I find interesting about resettlement because it nicely combines again sort of internal the tools we have combining with the external projection. And here it is. It says, can resettlement be an instrument to support the EU's geopolitical relevance in a certain region? Um, I think supporting geopolitical relevance is a bit of a tall order for resettlement. Actually, when I saw the question, I was, uh, I was trying to think about you know, other actors, be it the United States, some others, who have been engaging in resettlement programs, and I uh, failed to discover, let's say, a single instance where I could uh, see this translating into geopolitical relevance, even though with the United States is kind of difficult <laughs> to identify. But it has been a mainstream idea in Brussels for years that resettlement uh, should be used preferably as a strategic uh, instrument, and I think this is something that has not fully materialized yet, because there indeed is a potential. It is something that has the potential of unblocking a lot of cooperation from certain counterparts. And whether or not we would call this a geopolitical relevance, I don't know. But it's certainly something very useful which we haven't been using enough. Okay. 
I don't, I don't know, of course, who asked the question and whether that, you know, what I'm going to say is behind that question. And, you know, as the EU wants to be an actor in the region, oh. uh, you know, the EU is known for, uh, for certain, you know, approaches, tools and so on. And I think also what, I mean, looking at the discussions we had before and the question about is it only through security, is it only through the fact in many, I think in many countries from, from the external view, the EU is seen as, okay, you know, migration is about return and readmission. Um, that this would be an additional tool the EU would be known for. Uh, uh, here we come, we want to be present, we want to be active, uh, uh, and that would be part of the, let's say, menu partner countries who want to engage in partnerships uh, uh, can count on. Yes. Very simply, yes. Good. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how that, uh, how that develops. Um, looking around if there are more uh, questions. Otherwise, I would come back to uh, sort of the last question also, uh, what we, or I had asked also uh, Johannes Luchner about title of our conference, also reimagining certain things, reimagining partnerships again, or lessons learned. Uh, um, what we have seen now one year after the pact is a bit short, I would say, but still I think the notion of reimagining and re-mentioning, I mean, again, I think uh, sort of this geopolitical element hasn't been so much of a part of the discussions in recent, uh, recent times, I would say, but yeah, are there elements where you say these are elements we have to reimagine, we have to, you know, we have to push ahead, I mean, you have been very strong putting forward elements, which is really about operational cooperation, which gives a very concrete perspective what within the EU, I think member states can count on when it comes to uh, the, uh, the agency. Um, yeah, so this reimagining of either partnerships or reimagining also tools we have uh, within the European Union. Nina. Yes, thank you, Ralph. I mean, I think when we, we discuss when we discuss partnerships with our friends outside Europe, I think that those partnerships need to be effective and they need to be robust. Um, I think that we can build partnerships um, comprehensively. We can build partnership on mutual interest. And of course, they, this partnership needs to be tailor-made. There, there's no one model for all, as it is not inside of Europe, of course. And that is the challenge that, of course, we all have. And so us from European side and also partners on the, other side, on, on, on the other hand. And I think that what has been also shown through the panel's discussions uh, today, um, those partnership needs to be built on many levels. So, for sure, let's say bilateral or even technical, so bilateral and political, regional, let's say, and also the global. And I think that what we need to reflect in Europe is that we should align our national politics with EU ones when it comes to the, the partnership uh, agreement. Because I think that European side should act as a Team Europe, because with that, okay, it gives us bigger leverage, but we can also offer more. And I think that this is also something that probably is not addressed very often, and I think it's, it's quite an important part, let's say, for, from our end. Just to conclude, I think that we are speaking for many, many years that we need to deliver when it comes to partnerships, um, and I don't think we're there yet. So I liked the title of the conference because I think that, you know, with all the challenges that have been addressed today and the challenges still persist, I think that, you know, this is gives us also, uh, challenges also always gives us the opportunity to reinvent, to reinforce and to reimagine. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, with that I would conclude and I'm thankful for the invitation again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vladimir. Mm -hmm. Thinking about what I might be missing a little in the um, uh, in migration partnerships and what might be the one thing to recommend when reimagining them, I would say um, strategic autonomy. You know, um, seeking partnerships, yes, investing in them, yes, sustaining them, relying on them, yes, yes. Um, 
making our own vital interests dependent on partnerships, uh, no. And this is, I think, an element that should be taken into account. There are simply situations where partnerships uh, don't cut it, and we should be aware of those. Thank you. Very clear. Um, I do realize that we have covered sort of from strategic autonomy, external dimension, geopolitical challenges to uh, uh, um, the entry-exit system uh, within the EU, which yeah, is a little bit broad for probably for, uh, for discussion, but I do hope that we have managed to shed some more light on the issues at stake one year after the pact, but there's not only the pact to, to refer to. You know, you have been very clear, I think, with regard to uh, also, you know, operational cooperation uh, support uh, which exists. I mean, this is, I'm underlining that because that's also an area as ICMPD, I think we uh, find ourselves and can identify ourselves very much so. Uh, and some call it sort of the bottom-up bottom harmonization, sort of creating realities and uh, encouraging, yeah, further cooperation, uh, trust building even within the European Union, uh, um, independent of all the uh, discussions about legislation and the broader political issues which we heard from the ministers before. So a very warm thanks to you and I think as my Director General would say, uh, a, a round of applause for uh, the now only two panelists but also Johannes Lutner. Thanks. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you guys. Good to <laughs>